Lee Judge, and welcome to today's webinar entitled The Eye of Making Your IVR Visual for Jakarta. Our name is Chris Dutoy, Director of Product Marketing at Jakarta. We'll take a quick look at the return on investing in visual IVR, and for you who are new to the concept, exactly what visual IVR is, improve your customer experience, and see how easily it can be implemented. So, let's begin. The presentation is all yours, Chris. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending. Uh, we know your time is precious, so we aim to make these webinars informative and quick and get to the point um, so we can get you back on your busy days. Uh, as Lee mentioned, our topic today is visual IVR, and uh, specifically the ROI behind going visual on your IVR. And we'll go with a, a ROI calculator, and I hope that you can follow along um, and even plug in your numbers to reflect your organization and get a, a feeling for what kind of your uh, you know what kind of return you would get on a visual VR. Uh, I give thanks to Lee for organizing all of this. Just the fact you're here today means that, that Lee found you and uh, and and you were kind to register for our webinars. Thank you, Lee. I'm um, just housekeeping items. We will have time for Q and A at the end of this. Um, even if we are running out of time, please go ahead and submit your questions. If we don't get to it online, we will absolutely get to you back to you personally uh, via email after the webinar. So, means, uh, you know, at any time, just ask your questions, uh, and we'll make sure we get them addressed. Um, also, I did mention this, but bears repeating: under the attendee window, you only see yourself. Uh, sorry, you aren't the only attendee. Uh, the others are just being blocked for privacy uh, concerns. So, thank you. And uh, let's get started with our webinar. What we'll see today is we're going to look at a quick look at the state of the IVR industry today um, and a little bit about what a visual IVR is for those of you who are just joining on the call or haven't really attended uh, any of these sessions before. Uh, and then looking at the ROI behind the visual R uh, IVR, and we'll, we'll use a calculator and we'll walk through that and you can follow along uh, how that goes. I thought. What better way to start a webinar on Visual IVR to get your reaction to uh, this slide? Thank you. Please and carefully as our menu options have recently changed. For building inquiries, please press 1. For changes, please press 2. For changes, please press 3. This is that doesn't probably resonate very well with you, yet we subject our customers to this every time they call. And we know that is a very necessary part of our organization and our customer service experience, denying that this is not really our preferred way of communicating with a customer. Let's look at the IVR and what I call war signs for your IVR or the theory in the coal mine. When you have zero out rate is approaching more than 7%. So by zero out, we mean the number of customers who will just, the very first time they hear, please listen carefully, the very first thing they do is reach for that zero key. They want to talk to an operator. They don't want to listen to your menu options. That's what we call mean by zero out. So when your zero out rate is more than 7%, there's a warning sign. There's no industry average or standard as to what is an acceptable percentage, but based on our experience and talk to our customers, uh, when this starts approaching more than 7%, certainly something you've got to keep an eye on. Uh, and we have stories of zero out rates exceeding 20%, um, which we imagine as a quarter or even a quarter of your users hit zero key and not really using your IVR. The second warning sign that your IVR is not what it should be. When customers reach an agent, they're already frustrated. And think about this. This is not a good way to start a customer interaction. You funnel them through a set of confusing menu options or even through poor voice recognition. And then when they reach you, they're already upset. Then you have to ask yourself, what was the benefit of funneling them through this that I've got an upset customer before I've even tried to resolve their problem? Certainly to keep an eye on. The warning sign for your IR. And the percentage of call transfers inside your call center is excessive. This is a sign of poor menu choices. So the customer ends up in the wrong queue and needs to be transferred. So you need to keep an eye on this internal transfer rate or how many bounces you get internally once the customer reaches an agent. If this is excessive, chances are they're getting confused by menu options. Warning sign for your IVR is when your website is listed on sites instructing callers how to zero out. 
Um, I think somewhat jokingly, but there's this big measure of truth there. There, there are websites dedicated to your, your customers how to bypass the IVR. Which areas of DTMF sequences should they dial to straight to an operator? Obviously, we're doing something wrong in the customer service industry when we're getting an ecosystem of sites that are, are good to telling our customers how to bypass our IVR. That wasn't the original intent behind our IVR. Uh, it's really something to, to keep an eye on. And then one of the big warning signs that your IVR is in trouble is when you don't want to call your own call center. And I've had this happen to me when my cable modem went out and I phoned my cable provider to come over and fix the modem. They sent a technician out. The technician uh, realized that the modem uh, was you know, shot and they had to replace the modem. They get a new modem and they now have to provision the modem. And what they do is they phone the technical support to provision a new modem. And believe it or not, that tech support agent has to phone the same 1-800 number that you or I would phone. Uh, and he was stuck in his own IVR uh, and cursing in my house and being more upset uh, than I think I was as a customer. So obviously not a thing when you don't want to phone your own call center. Okay, people don't hate IVR self-service. They hate, they hate bad self-service. There are some wonderful IVR implementations that, that we've all come across, and then there are those that, that are not good. Uh, and so it's not the IVR itself that, that's to blame. Often it's just we're forced to implement it in a certain way. What are the things that customers that, that hate? And, and this slide is kind of easy to put together because if I'd asked all of you right here on the webinar, what do you hate when you phone a, custom, a, a company and, and deal with the IVR, you'd probably come up with very much the same options. The first is forced to listen to long introductory prompts. Um, sometimes we've seen introductory prompts exceeding one minute. Um, and trust me, when I'm calling back for the third time with the same issue, I'd really you try and understand my call first before trying to upsell me or give me this long one-minute introductory prompt. Uh, so, so keep an eye on, on those. Don't keep them too long. The thing we hate uh, about bad self-service is when the menu options are so long, you can't remember which one you should have chosen. And in a generation of Twitter, you consume 140 characters at a time. So by the seventh menu option, I remember the first Three. So try not to make your menu trees that big, that they're that confusing, or forcing the person to take notes as they're listening to the IVR tree. The third is when the menu options are confusing. Three? No, wait, two. Yes, two was the right one. What's the difference between account services and option three, which is account inquiries? Sometimes they're confusing, and what happens is the customer select the wrong one, and then back to our first slide, we talked about the internal bounce rate. I select account services, I reach an agent, and they say, oh, you actually need to be at account inquiries, and they bring me over. So I like these confusing menu options. Make them clear. Another problem with these is when there's no clear navigation path. I've gone down four trees, four brides. I realize, wait a minute, how do I get back? So, you know, let me the asterisk. Oh, no me back to the beginning and have to start all over. Give me a clear breadcrumb or navigation path that makes it very easy for me to navigate up and down the tree, at least as easy as it can be uh, on an audio experience. And the first thing we hate about bad self-service is why should I enter anything in here when the first thing you're going to ask me to connect is you're going to ask me for the information again. So please either fix that screen pop so that the information shows up or don't ask me for that information. I understand sometimes there's compliance and verification purposes, but please ask me to enter everything and then ask me for that information again the moment I connect with the voice call. We must come to expect it, yet we still get very irritated by it. So people say, well, wait a minute, isn't the IVR dying? So let's just look at the IVR trends and predictions as we see them. Um, Social media will not replace the IVR. There's a lot of uh, buzz about social media, and actually what we find with social media is very much just reputation management. The social media channels are trying to ensure that there's nothing damaging being said by the company, but it has not become a focal uh, customer touch point uh, in terms of solving your customer support issues or reorganization in the first place. So the social media, as we see it, is not replacing the IVR. The demand for multiple touch points will increase, the two C's, um, and I, I call the two C's, it's consistency and continuity. The 
means I need the same information from your company regardless of how I'm touching your company. You know, a website tells me that it's a two-year contract, um, but the agent on the phone is telling me it's an 18-month contract, and the IR was telling me that it's a 16-month contract. Um, I'm getting conflicting information, and, and so I need consistency across the channels. It sounds obvious, but it's very difficult for many companies to implement because we have different technologies across different channels, um, but the, the demand for this is going to increase. We need the consistency. The other C is the continuity aspect. If I start my transaction in the morning before work on the website to, uh, for example, book my plane reservation, uh, and I jump in the car to get to work, and I phone you, um, let's have continuity across that transaction. Understand that I was making a, a, a plane reservation and have my, my details in front of you so I have to start the interaction from the beginning. Generation of IVRs will need to emphasize self-service. Um, it's no secret, of course. IVRs in many cases are used as a call deflection mechanism and sometimes purposely making it hard for customers to reach you. Um, but as we IVRs mature, we're seeing a bigger emphasis on self-service, not just a routing engine. Um, it's trying to reduce inbound call volume, but adequate self-service options. Um, and, and so we see IVRs really expanding in this area and becoming uh, better at creating self-service type interactions. XML will become the standard. Um, if new IVRs already support it, and legacy ones will support it, um, or face being labeled legacy forever. So we, we do voice XML as a standard for implementing these IVRs. Uh, IVR is going to remain a fundamental channel. Um, about it. It's just the way people interact with it may change. So I want to be clear, we know the IVR is important. Um, the IVR teams work incredibly hard to make this as good an experience as possible in the face of changing requirements from the business all the time. Uh, IVRs will remain there. It's just the way we interact with it uh, may change or expand. And then mobile doesn't really help the problem. We spoke about the issues with IVRs that we as customers don't like. And it just really gets exacerbated in the mobile world. Um, it does lend itself well to the mobile mindset. And if you think about it for a second, when you work with your iPhone or your Android, every time you push another menu option, you have to take the phone away from your ear, look at the screen, push the option, and then put it back to your ear to listen to the next tree. Um, and you do this for four or five trees uh, uh, navigating through that IVR. It's very difficult. Uh, it really lends itself what's that mobile mindset. As a result, what happens, of course, is just easier to zero out than to get the tree. And that's what we spoke about right up front is this high zero out rate because, quite frankly, sometimes that's just easier. So, so the goal when we look at something like visual IVR is to do more of these IVR calls um, to be an effective self-service offering. Um, if we can reduce inbound calls, of course, that's a lot of money saved. Um, and from a customer perspective, if we can reduce their challenge, uh, that's a win-win. Um, for the calls that do come in, there are the complex calls. You're always going to need to speak to somebody. But when they call in, let's know more about them and what they want. Let's not ask them for all that information again uh, and, and upset them right at, at the get-go. Uh, ultimately, decrease the amount of zero outs that we see in these IVRs. This is what we call visual IVR. And a picture is worth a thousand words, and it really is providing a visual interface based off of your IVR, so that you can get the benefits of IVR and reuse and extend IVR investment and list that in both the mobile and the web uh, channels. See um, here is depiction on a phone. Uh, so I would just click reservations, new flight reservation uh, before reaching an operator. Clearly a simplistic example, but you get the sense that it's visual and I see the menu options versus trying to listen to them uh, one by one. And, and don't understand the power of actually integrating VR on your website. If you take a moment to think, how are your customers reaching you? There's a chance they're already on your website or then to Google your number to find your website, to find your contact number. So many users are actually going to start the initiation or the interaction on your website. Um, with IVR, you can actually extend your IVR directly into your website 
um, by letting the user start the IVR experience right there. So in this example, the user clicks contact, and instead of showing the phone numbers, um, we start the IVR transaction right there, uh, and you can click your way through that IVR, uh, ultimately choosing the right options so that you get routed to the right agent and uh, get a, a better call and start the interaction sort of uh, context to what the user was doing. So, so in, in short, Visual IVR will take your existing IVR, that audio experience, uh, and map it visually for both your mobile customers and web customers. And benefits, once you've gone visual only, uh, you can support alphanumeric data, which is uh, clearly something that's limiting on DTMF dialing, uh, which has limited a lot of what IVR can do from a self-service capability, of course, because of lack of alphanumeric or easy alphanumeric support. So uh, clearly that, that helps being able to add that um, and be able to add a back button so that you can actually navigate back up the tree very easily versus trying to hit the asterisk or the zero and hitting the wrong option and starting all over again. Ultimately, the no repeating of information uh, by putting a rich pop in front of the agent so that the agent can see everything that the customer has done up to that point uh, of the call coming in. And so we can avoid that, may I have your account number again, scenario. Uh, and, and ultimately, Visual VR delivers a better experience. You know, Visual is far different than listening to audio. I can scan a screen, either my smartphone screen or my website, Farther than I can uh, listening to a list of those instructions. As I mentioned, it's not uncommon for that introductory prompt alone to be over one minute, and then I'm sort of forced to listen to that uh, uh, before I can select the next menu option. Um, you know, very quickly as to how does it work, um, it works with your existing IVR, and this is a point I need to stress. Uh, IVR today, depicted here in number one, uh, is likely using something called VXML or Voice XML. XML really sort of converted or rendered as those audio prompts that a user gets on their phone. Please push one for billing, two for account services. Uh, really taking that VXML and just giving you the audio representation of it. So we do the same thing. We take those existing VXML apps that you have or scripts, uh, and through our Visual IVR server, we work them in real time as visual options, either on a phone or on your website. So it's, it's using your existing IVR scripts. You're not creating a new set of IVR scripts. The whole intent behind Visual IVR is to work side by side with your existing IVR and just give you additional channels that your IVR can use. Uh, and then uh, as a user, I can see them visually and then ultimately write to an agent using your existing uh, telephony infrastructure. So it's not a big operation. We're not coming and replacing everything uh, in your organization. We want to read your existing IVR, reuse your, your existing VXML scripts, uh, and reuse your existing telephony infrastructure. So very non-invasive uh, sort of point to your existing tab. You might be thinking, it sounds good, but what's the ROI behind this? Um, and it's a good question, and that's what we want to look at in this webinar. Um, what we'll do is we'll model a sample company um, and, and you can follow along by using the link in your chat window. Lee will send out uh, the link uh, to the Visual IVR calculator, or uh, by all means, you can just watch me and follow along with me. Um, and then at a later time, when you metrics for your organization, you can go plug them in and, uh, and try it for yourself and, and see what you we can do. Obviously, with any ROI model, we need to make some assumptions. And in the calculator, we give you the ability to play with those assumptions to kind of do a what-if type of this uh, and sort of play permutations and combinations and see how the ROI uh, might work in your organization. So, so I've made some assumptions, and, and I'll, I'll highlight them as I go through it, but just remember you can change it. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, is work with a company of around 60,000 calls per month. Of course, we've got a very diverse audience base uh, on the call today, some with much smaller organizations, some with much larger organizations. Um, I've opted to use a, a fictitious company of about 60,000 calls per month um, as a frame of reference. And obviously, you can adjust that based on your organization as well. Um, and, and feel free to change that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my... my
ask for a audio confirmation that uh, you're able to see the desktop? Yes, we can see it. Great, thank you. So what we're showing here is the visual ROI calculator. And again, Lee will send you out this link uh, so you can play along uh, with your own numbers. So let me orientate you and to walk you through what you're seeing here. Um, all the fields in an orange or yellow color are fields that are requiring your input because they're actual inputs to the model. Um, and we can look here. So I mentioned 60,000 calls per month, um, and obviously you would adjust this as necessary. Minutes per call, uh, in terms of how long your current calls take, um, obviously coming in a, in a troubleshooting technical support industry, that might be higher, or, or in, in a customer sit, uh, sit situation, that might be lower. Um, I'm using four minutes here. The eight transfers per month, these are the number of transfers that happen reaches an agent. We mentioned that internal transfer rate because of you know poor menu options or confusing menu options. This is that number I was referring to and the agent bounces the caller to someone else uh, the moment they reach the agent. So um, it, it does have an effect on our ROI. Uh, so if you have that number, great, you know, use it. Um, the cut off service success percentage. So this is important, of course. This, this is the you're getting in your IVR today. So of the callers coming into your IVR, what we're saying is that 35% are able to resolve the call in the IVR today successfully without needing to escalate that to a voice call. See, that's going to vary from industry to industry and company to company, uh, but this is what we mean by this number. So if you have that number, that's what you would put in here as your current self-service success percentage. Cost per minute is really only applicable if you're using a hosted IVR solution, um, and the telco cost per minute is, you know, likely you, you, your customers are reaching you on a 1-800 number, toll-free number, uh, that, of course, is the telco cost per minute that you're paying for that number. If you can take users from the voice channel to the visual IVR channel or from your IVR to your visual IVR, um, visual is data, so you're not using up your toll-free minutes um, as the customers are calling. So there is a savings there as well. Um, and then the cost of your agent voice call. So you need to be, this is your fully loaded agent cost um, and expressed per uh, And fully loaded is defined by your organization, typically includes a full head behind an agent, including a, a fractional facilities portion, et cetera. So that's your agent call per minute. Hand side in this little panel that you see here, inbound calls. Um, take a minute just to think of how are my customers reaching me? They phone me. How do they phone me? Uh, and there's really sort of broad four ways that they phone you. The because they're already logged into your web service site or your website. Um, and in that example I showed you, I was on the travel site and I clicked the contact button to find the phone number. So there are a percentage of people that will be logged in to the web self-service site, and they're going to reach out for the contact number and try and phone you. There's a certain number of your users who have a mobile app, uh, and they're already on the mobile app, and they decide they need to talk to you, and they're going to look for the contact button, the contact hyperlink, or the phone number. So, so there are a percentage of those users. Then the percentage, uh, they do the web search, the Googlers, as I would call them. These are the ones who like, I need to phone company X. Let me go them and find their phone number. Um, and that's probably a large, surprisingly large uh, number of people coming into your organization that way. I know I do that often. Um, I, I just Google, Google, find your number, and then try and call you. Um, so so that, that's certainly a, a very viable way of reaching your organization. And, and then finally, there are a number of people who are going to reach you based on knowing your number. That might be that they have the bill in front of them. Them, they have the credit card in front of them, they have an invoice, uh, or they have already in your speed dial, which by itself is probably not a good sign. But the, the number of people that, that's going to have your number, um, we could affect that, that percentage of the population because they're going to call your voice call center right off the bat. They already have your number. But we can certainly affect these three coming in, uh, Googling you that are on your website or on your mobile app. Um, so you adjust these sliders. Uh, to, to, to indicate uh, the, you know, what you believe the numbers are in your organization and attention. Of course, this should not exceed 100%, so feel free to adjust the sliders as you wish, um, but that should be up to 100% uh, in terms of the, the way people are reading you. On the other tab, this is where you get to play what if, um, and you can try different combinations and 
permutations. Um, and if you don't agree with the numbers, you know, we've put down, you can lower them, you can increase them, uh, and just try try different options, best scenario, worst case scenario, and so forth. So the first assumption, uh, visual IVR usage percentage. So um, this is this this is of the people we could potentially offer visual IVR to. How many would actually take us up on the visual IVR? So put that in context. People coming in from your web self-service site on your mobile or Googling you to get your number, of those people who come in, we see a percent of them will use the IVR option if presented to them. And the other 20% are going to proceed on to a straight uh, voice IVR experience. So obviously you can adjust this uh, as, as you see fit. Then we've got the visual IVR self-service success percentage. First tab, we said, what's your current percentage in your IVR, your self-service success percentage in your IVR? And you listed this as 35%. So we see when you go to visual IVR, they increase the self-service percentage to 37%. So in other words, we're saying very modestly, we, we expect the self-service capabilities to be 2% than your current IVR. And obviously, that's a very conservative estimate. Um, I think that with a visual experience, and being able to go back and entering alphanumeric data, that the self-service experience should be better. Uh, just for purposes of this model, we're saying 2%, uh, and obviously you can uh, increase that if you want to try different options. Uh, and then the number of visual IVR transfers avoided. Uh, this is by the fact that my routing will now be better. I can try the different menu options. I can click back easily and step up through the visual options and make sure I go down the right path. Because that when I reach an agent, if I do choose to reach an agent, I'm probably the right agent versus being bounced internally uh, to to another agent. Um, and and we, we're estimating a 10% save on that internal bounce rate here, um, saving about a minute a call with that bounce rate um, as well. So, so the assumptions, the input uh, behind the scenes will just give you some details on the calculations and and how they're made, and we can explore as time permitting. Um, but but you know, when you download this calculator for yourself or just your online version, you look at these numbers in some more detail. So what it gives you once you um, sort of strap all these assumptions and inputs is you will see in the tab below your savings and your return on investment. So a couple of things to point out. This is your cumulative three-year savings um, and then savings after we subtracted the actual cost of implementing uh, the visual IVR technology. So this is your net savings over a three-year period. I will point out um, I'm not using a, a, a sort of technology adoption curve here. It's assuming sort of just this, this, this adoption. Obviously, you might find an adoption curve, but your net three-year savings results still uh, the same savings, assuming you get uh, adoption over that three-year period. Um, so in this example of our company of 60,000 calls per month with four minutes per call, um, we see significant savings over the three years. And, and this is not a large company. Um, this is approximately 150 to 180 agents, um, and seeing a pretty good savings here over the three-year period, uh, just reducing calls to the call center, increasing the self-service options, um, and the, the balance rates. Um, on the right side here, you can actually see how the savings are accomplished and, and how we break them down. Uh, if you hover over it, it'll tell you how those savings are, are compared. Uh, and of course, here you can see a large part of the savings is just minutes deflected out of your existing IVR uh, because you pay at IVR cost. Uh, if we can take those IVR minutes and use them in IVR, uh, not use phone charges, not use IVR charges, uh, it's clearly a big win. And getting agent calls, um, you know, by every every call saved, there's a lot of money saved. So so we can sort of save a lot on the agent calls. Um, and then basically looking at the transfers of avoided. Not Massive component behind the ROI, but still a component behind the ROI, uh, buying that internal bounce rate. Um, and, and of course, that's a better customer experience, but here we're just looking at the hard ROI. So, so certainly try the ROI calculator. You can play with these sliders. You'll see as I slide them, uh, things will finish visually, um, and, and you can try your different what ifs and not uh, your adoption. If you think your IVR adoption will be lower, or think that you're going to get more success in the IVR. Clearly, if I move this up, that's got a massive impact um, on savings. You can see here my three savings are 
you know, pushing four hundred thousand dollars a year if I get a forty one percent option in my in my VR self service channel. So uh these numbers just by making slight changes can obviously have big impacts. Um but try and make a business case internally to your organization uh it's a good idea to try, you know, your best best uh try a worst case scenario, try a best case scenario. Uh, it's about a couple of options, and you know you're obviously going to land somewhere in between. But it's a good ballpark and a and a good start getting a sense of what kind of ROI you can get by starting to deflect people out of your IVR into a visual IVR uh, and provide visual IVR on your website uh, as well as your mobile. I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint and Lee, if you can give me a, a, a audio confession that you can see the uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, PowerPoint now. All right, great. Uh, and in your chat window, you will see that Lee has sent out the link to the IVR calculator. So by all means, um, try that out. And if you have any questions, um, you know, uh, just email us, and we will absolutely uh, help you walk through it and, and show you some of the the math behind the scenes. Uh, if you as to how we're deriving some of those values. So uh, I hope that helped and give you a sense of the, of the sense that are inherently possible moving through to a visual channel uh, and certainly encourage you just to play with it. Um, you need to register to get to that calculator. You can just uh, link and, and start playing. Um, and, and if you have questions, reach out to us. In this case, is, is hopefully made clear behind the ROI alone, but um, you know th this one is rare technology opportunities where there's a bit there's benefits for your customer benefits for your business. It's, it's not an either or. On um, the customer side, you know, your customer is not really caring about your ROI model, um, but the customer's benefits, it's much easier to navigate visually. I don't have to listen to those complete menu trees. Um, you know, the, the get I can get access to the information I need, uh, hit the back button when I need to go up. It's just a lot easier than listening to those long menu trees. So as a customer, um, I, I, you know, I would certainly find that, that more, more of a, a a pleasant experience. Um, no repeating of information. It's really kind of a pet peeve of mine, and, and I'm sure for many of you on the call, this is, you know, I get the screen pop, um, and you, you ask me for everything I just entered in the IVR, a kind of natural inclination or even natural resentment of why you ask me for that information if you're not really using it. So now have that information available because we do offer the ability um, to give you this rich screen pop it shows you everything that the person did during their visual IVR session, whether that's on the website or on the mobile side. Um, and then just a better customer experience, uh, offering you know reduced call times, reduced hold times, because at the end of my IVR, visual IVR experience, uh, we can say the wait time and say, you know, it's 10 minutes waiting time. Would you like to hold uh, or would you like to have a call back? So you, so you can certainly give a better customer experience. And to your business, I think we've, you know, we've, we've, we've looked at those pretty well just by virtue of the fact that we looked at the ROI calculator, uh, but it dramatically reduced costs, less zero outs, lower IVR and telephony charges, um, and then recall time. So this is by providing that rich screen pop uh, and preventing the, the agent from starting a triage right up front again, uh, that's, it's a lower average handle time. We save precious seconds by that information available. Um, and in fact, that your run has now improved, less zero outs, means that you've got the right agent to solve your job. Um, ultimately, an easy implementation. It was a key design goal that we want to recognize the investment you've made in your IVR, recognize the importance of the IVR and the great strides you've made on your IVR, but say, look, let's take that IVR and just extend its reach out into both the mobile and the web channel by providing this visual interface on your IVR. So you don't have an additional set of scripts to maintain. You're not creating a new set of customer interactions. We are reusing what you do today. So that concludes the presentation. We do have a number of questions that we will get to. Lee will moderate those questions. Uh, if, uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and ask them as well. And I mentioned if we don't get to them, we will certainly respond uh, to you via email as well. I will hand it back to you. For your valuable insights on visual IVR and on the ROI of investing in a visual IVR. Um, as Chris stated earlier, I've already posted the link to the ROI calculator in the chat window, so you can go ahead and click on that and, and play with it and adjust it to your particular scenario. Uh, meanwhile, we'll now answer a few questions that are already in our Q&A window. 
Uh, let's see, we have several. So the ones we can address today, we will uh, respond to your emails and respond to your questions directly uh, to get answers to you. Uh, the first question we have here, Chris, it says, um, I believe, on the behind the scenes, you showed the number of calls deflected to VR. Can you explain how that was calculated? And uh, that viewer had a keen eye to see that tab that quickly. Um, so the 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 behind the scenes with the calls deflected to the visual IVR, uh, it's based on two sets of the input parameters. What you first specify is how many users we have the option of offering visual IVR to. And the example I'd used was people who are using your, your bill or your invoice and have your number and are going to call directly. We don't have the option really of offering them visual IVR at that moment. So it's the users, the ones who come in through Google, who come in through your website, who come in from your mobile app, the users that we get a chance to offer visual IVR. So we take those users and from those users, we take a percentage that we think might use visual IVR to them. So it's a percentage of a percentage, and that ultimately is what the number of calls deflected to the visual IVR is. Okay. Uh, question also regarding the calculator. Um, it says, on the bar chart, uh, they grow every year. Is this because you expect adoption to increase, and where do I see that? Yeah, it's it may, you know, it's it's not it's assuming um, it's assuming adoption right up in year one. Um, it's not taking a technology adoption curve into consideration. Um, but your net through savings, if you assume that your technology will be adopted over the three years, will be the same. So what you might find, uh, sort of in practice, is maybe lower first year savings, um, and then savings sort of increasing and ultimately reaching the same point over a three-year savings if you want to factor in a technology adoption. Okay, good. Now, we have several, we have lots of question com questions coming in. This is this is great. I just want to make sure that uh, you know that we will respond to you as soon as we're, uh, as soon as the event uh, ends. Question, Chris, I, I see a few folks are actually a little new to Visual IVR. So um, the next question says, what if our IVR doesn't use XML? We chose uh, VXML or Voice XML really as an internal standard, um, just because that's what IVR players seem to be migrating towards. So there's a good chance uh, most IVRs do support VXML. If it doesn't, there's still a very good chance we can work with it, uh, provided it gives us some level of metadata, if you will, um, to be able to convert uh, in time to the visual IVR. So, so we have worked with non-VXML. Uh, really, it's going to depend on your specific implementation. So, um, this this next question actually may have sort of been answered in that last uh, response. But to make things very clear, the next question the person asks: In order to get visual IVR, do they have to replace their existing IVR system? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, what we want to do is make visual IVR a companion to your IVR. So, the whole idea is to use your IVR uh, and reuse your IVR. To give you the visual IVR capabilities. Okay. Uh, the next question is: It says uh, in the example provided, based on a company of about 150 FTE, what would the initial investment be as an estimate? Okay. So in my calculator, I'd said it's around 150 agent company. From an investment perspective, you you have different options. We have different licensing models. So you can either do a transaction-based pricing, um, which means that your cost uh, is only based on the adoption that you're getting from your customers. So it's kind of the, the lower risk approach, if you will. If you see what adoption is like, go with the transaction pricing. Uh, and then alternatively, you can also do a perpetual concussion-based pricing. Um, so to figure out um, what that total investment would be, you would have to make a gauge as to what kind of concurrent sessions you're expecting on the IVR. So um, certainly, you know, feel free to follow up with us for more detailed pricing information. But at this point, I do want to let you know you can either go transactional pricing or perpetual concurrent session pricing, whichever fits better with your environment. Okay. Um, going sure we have two more questions we're going to uh, respond to. The rest we'll get to you. I'll uh, respond to you via email. Uh, the next question says, we use pre-recorded voice prompts in our VR tree. So what about these? It's, it's not uncommon to see um, vi, vi, I'm sorry, IVR 
script that reference pre-recorded sound files. So it might reference, you know, greeting.wave or .mp3. Um, what you do in those cases is there's a one-time exercise of mapping those audio files to a corresponding visual prompt. Um, it's, it's a very quick exercise and it's really it's a one-time initiative. So if you are using a lot of pre-recorded prompts, what we will do is go through your script uh, just as a one-time exercise and do some mapping uh, of, of those audio prompts. So really not a, not a problem. Okay. Our last question along the same lines, uh, since you mentioned uh, voice prompts, uh, does this work only in English or what about other languages? Uh, you know, it's, it's language neutral. Um, we ourselves don't really concern ourselves with the language, and, and really what I mean by that is we're not trying to parse the audio prompt. So we're going to use what your IVR is using uh, in whichever language it's using. Um, so so we, we try and remain, to, you know, language agnostic, so uh, certainly not a problem to work with multiple languages. Once again, Chris, thank you for uh, your valuable information. That concludes our webinar, the ROI of making your IVR visual. If there are any questions that we weren't able to answer during the today's session, we'll be respond to, you, to those directly after the event. We hope you have insight and visual IVR and how you can easily utilize it to enhance your organization's IVR. A review of the event will be available soon on jakarta.com. If you want to get a copy of the slide decks, please contact me directly at ljudge at jakarta.com. Thank you for attending today. Please visit us again and have a wonderful day.